And we will be hearing from Linda Nicholson, Sophia Malik, and David Safraz from the Ontario Ministry of Education in Toronto, Canada. Uh, Linda is the Research Strategy Project Lead and has worked for the Canadian government for over 30 years. Sophia is the Senior Knowledge Mobilization Coordinator and Project Lead and is responsible for building organizational capacity for evidence use. And Davoud is the Research and Knowledge, knowledge Mobilization Analyst who has a lot of experience with both Canadian national and international settings. So with that, if you all are ready, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the introduction, Stephen. Can you hear us okay? It sounds great. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So um, I want to welcome everyone joining us today. Uh, we are going to be speaking about communication tools for moving research to practice with a specific focus on social media, the power and potential, and lessons learned from a project uh, in Canada, in Ontario. And um, this, this initiative is actually called NAIR for short, or the Knowledge Network of Applied Education Research. And so today, the, the primary focus of our, our talk is going to be centering around the lessons that we've learned from engaging with various stakeholders through this initiative. So we're going to walk you through a little bit about NAIR itself. And throughout, we will be sharing with you about um, you know, how, this, how this evolved, this, this initiative, um, what the kind of core key theoretical underpinnings are of the initiative itself. Um, where we are right now, uh, as we're rolling out some thematic knowledge networks, and we'll explain uh, a little bit of what we mean there, um, as well as the social media strategy, which, uh, which is a key component of the NAIR as we're moving into the second phase of implementation. Um, and then I'm going to speak a little bit about understanding impact. So in terms of the evolution of the NAIR, so just to provide you a little bit of background, um, about the NAIR itself. So this is a, uh, a unique and innovative project, or I should say initiative, that's um, situated in Ontario. Um, you could say that you know, it's headquartered in the city of Toronto at the Ontario Ministry of Education. And we work closely with our partners, two university partners, the University of Toronto and specifically the faculties of education um, at both institutions, at Western University uh, which is in London, Ontario. Um, so um, the the team for the, the project teams are so at the ministry we have the education research and evaluation strategy branch and today being represented by myself, Linda and Davoud, um, as well as the co-directors at each institution and the program managers. So I do want to say it is, as I said, it's a unique collaboration between a government and a university among the first of its kind of this nature that's focused on knowledge mobilization. And when I say knowledge mobilization, I'm not sure if anyone's heard this term before. Please feel free to, to, to write if you, you have heard of this term. Um, it, I will speak about uh, what, what, what it means to us, how we're defining it. And in, in a lot of it's grounded in the theoretical research, but also about 10 years worth of really um, strong interest in this area in our province, specifically in education, but we take a lot of lessons from the health sector as well in terms of um, the mobilization and knowledge translation activities. But in terms of how we're um, defining it and we're implementing it, is we're developing and expanding networks to share and apply knowledge. Um, we're building capacity uh, internally within the ministry, but also with it, with, across the sector with our various stakeholders, which include educators, parents, teachers, students, and um, different types of organizations um, to share, understand, use, and disseminate research knowledge. Um, and so we're also going to be engaging in sustaining interactive activities for knowledge co-creation and sharing, um, and all throughout producing, drawing on, and using actionable resources to share and apply knowledge. Um, so there are other terms that have been used that are, you could say, in the same family of knowledge mobilization. And these may be familiar to you. So knowledge transfer is quite commonly used, uh, predominantly in the health sector. Um, knowledge management, knowledge translation, also very uh, key in, in health in particular, and knowledge exchange, which implies a more a mutual um, exchange relationship. Uh, the term mobilization, so knowledge mobilization, implies a dynamic, interactive relationship uh, between and among the research users, 
producers and the knowledge brokers in this whole scheme. So those are some fundamental core ideas that underlie the NAIR. Um, also some key questions that, to, that um, we, we always consider when it comes to knowledge mobilization are here, and this is derived from the, the Social Science of the Humanities Research Council, that's a federal agency in Canada. Um, key questions to consider, to whom should research results be communicated? So thinking about audience. How is the process of communicating research results best mapped? How will the proposed knowledge mobilization activities advance the stated research goals? And will interactions with knowledge users be fed into research design? So that's, that's about a model that's more co collaborative and co-creation based. Um, how will interactions be sustained beyond the life of the project? So this is, the, this is often a challenge that we're left with, especially when we're talking about projects that are funded for a certain number of years, whether it's three years or four years and so on in some cases. What happens when the funding is no longer there? How do you continue the sustainability uh, of the interactions and all the great work that was done during the course of the funding um, and, and continuing to build on those successes and those relationships? So I am now going to walk us through um, a little bit about the first phase of the NAIR. So to give you a little bit of background, so this, this initiative began in 2010. Um, Similarly, you know, as a partnership between the ministry and its university partners, University of Toronto and Western University in Ontario, um, there, uh, in the first phase of its implementation, there were 44 projects across uh, Ontario in education. And these 44 projects were aligning with the Ministry of Ontario, sorry, the Ontario Ministry of Education's priority areas, such as, for example, closing the achievement gap for students or improving equitable outcomes for students. And, um, and these operated in pretty discrete and distinct ways. Um, we, we, we learned from that um, implementation that while a lot of uh, activity was happening around knowledge mobilization and we were building capacity around knowledge mobilization, there were differing understandings of what knowledge mobilization sorry, knowledge mobilization means. And we, are, we came to understand that, that a lot of really great actionable resource products were developed. However, a big area of need was in terms of mediation and brokering of relationships. And for these 44 projects to be able to connect for each other, we saw there was a greater need for that between and among different organizations and partners involved. Um, and uh, the time frame for that first phase for each project was about one to two years. Um, and there were different funding amounts for each project and all along, as I mentioned, uh, four broad priority areas uh, based on ministry priorities. Um, and if anyone's interested, um, we, we do encourage you to visit the NAIR website, which is full of some really great examples and resources of research products, but also about different knowledge mobilization strategies, um, how to develop a knowledge mobilization plan. There are resources and toolkits available. And also we, we feature guest blogs periodically from, um, from different scholars in the field of evidence use. Um, nationally and internationally. And um, with that, I actually um, want to mention that um, we are entering into the second phase of the NAIR. So this is bringing it to present day. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Linda Nicholson. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. So as Sophia mentioned, we're now, we're now heading into phase two of the NAIR. Um, and in this phase, we're establishing up to four different research to practice thematic knowledge networks to support identification, sharing, adaptation, and implementation of evidence-informed educational practices that are aligned with the ministry's uh, goals. These thematic knowledge networks will focus on priority topics and will receive multi-year funding for their work and the work of related communities of practice. And in fact, we know what the first two um, networks uh, will be focused on, because we have just named um, hosts of the first two. One is going to be focused on mathematics learning, and the second one is going to be focused on promoting well-being in education. So we're really excited that those are um, um, in, the, in the startup phases. 
The purpose of the thematic knowledge networks will be to build system capacity for knowledge mobilization and research use and facilitate the implementation of evidence-informed education practices to enhance professional practice and students' learning equity and well-being. So to lead into talking about the new NAIR model, um, I, I just want to briefly talk about three network models that um, have existed and um, continue. The first one is uh, linear models. Um, and in linear network models, research is produced and then made available for users in a mainly one-way relationship. Linear models have been abundant uh, within knowledge mobilization and practice. However, they haven't been very effective for many reasons, including their assumption that knowledge can be moved from production to use through predictable and manageable stages. Research studies on the barriers and facilitators of knowledge mobilization have led to a shift away from linear models that, has, that, ha, that have shown limited effectiveness and towards more complex models that put an emphasis on interaction, ongoing exchange, shared learning, collaboration, and the implementation rather than dissemination of knowledge. So, Rather than replacing linear models, the second type of knowledge mobilization model builds on the linear model, and that's the relationship model. Um, these still include dissemination strategies, but the focus is broadened to relationship building, knowledge exchange, and continuous learning and feedback. Relationship models prioritize the development of partnerships and networks. Their aim is to increase the multi-directional flow of knowledge between and among researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and other stakeholders. The third knowledge mobilization model is the systems model. Systems frameworks and models go beyond earlier notions of mobilization and evidence use by viewing knowledge mobilization as a system in itself, one that connects and coordinates multiple individuals and organizations at different levels over the long term in order to have a direct impact on outcomes. Some of the features of systems models include that stakeholders are involved at every level, knowledge mobilization is ongoing and long term, opportunities exist for interaction and links among the diverse stakeholders leading to exchange of knowledge and skills, shared learning, collaboration, and co-creation. There is political and financial commitment to knowledge mobilization over the long term. And leaders are actively engaged and committed to knowledge mobilization. So with that in mind, this is our model for the renewed Knowledge Network for Applied Education Research, or NAIR. We propose that it is a hybrid model combining the best elements of a relationship model uh, while integrating elements of a systems model. The main feature of the renewed NAIR is that it will be made up of thematic networks. Thematic networks are a form of social organization connected with the building and maintenance of relationships among a wide range of groups and institutions that share common interests, goals, or expertise. That is, they share an interest in a theme. And I mentioned that our first two themes are around math. One is math and one is well-being. The purpose of thematic models, network models, is to strengthen links within communities of practice, allow individuals to gather and gain access to information, facilitate sharing and exchange of knowledge and resources, and organize and create knowledge in flexible ways. So let's look for just a minute at the bodies that oversee the work of the network. The Ontario Ministry of Education's Research and Evaluation Strategy Branch, of which myself and my colleagues are a part, is the funder for the NAIR, responsible for supporting the implementation of NAIR and managing contracts and transfer payment agreements with the NAIR Secretariat and the network host. The Secretariat, as, the, as Sophia mentioned, are our university partners at University of Toronto OISE and Western. In this renewed structure, the work of our university partners is formalized in an agreement um, where we're calling them <coughs> a secretariat, and they're serving as a bridge between our planning and implementation committee and the network. The secretariat will function as a knowledge mobilization intermediary and broker. 
The Planning and Implementation Committee is responsible for governance and oversight of NARE, provincial leadership and championing of NARE-generated activities, oversight of funding and adjudication criteria, and development of infrastructure and culture to support knowledge mobilization. The Ontario Education Research Panel is a group of education research champions who are external to the ministry, and they are going to take on a new role of advisory board to the NAIR. So the, the chair of the Ontario Education Research Panel will also be a member of the Planning and Implementation Committee. So uh, we've been talking about hosts and networks and communities of practice, so let me just um, briefly talk about what each of these um, players in the in the network um, are going to to do. Um, each knowledge network host will be an organization that's well established and has credibility and strong provincial connections. The host will facilitate, support, champion, and enable connections and sharing across its network. The host will have reach and spread of influence beyond what a single project or a local community of practice could do or have. As the network leader, the host organization will demonstrate the organizational and leadership capacities required to support large-scale knowledge mobilization efforts. The networks themselves uh, will bring together multiple partners to form a network. They will work collaboratively. Um, supporting evidence-informed practices connected to the ministry's goals. The connections between and among the networks will be encouraged, and you noticed on the on the diagram how they were, it was a, it was a Venn diagram, they were overlapping circles. Um, the connections among them will be encouraged in order to maximize the outcomes related to the NARE objectives, which are mobilization, collaboration, interaction, and sharing of research and practices uh, to improve the achievement and well-being of Ontario students and early learners. Thematic Knowledge Network partner organizations may exist at either the provincial or regional and local level. And finally, the communities of practice. Each thematic network will include several communities of practice where people can gather around questions that are important to them. This goes beyond sharing and talking and gets right down to hands-on collaborative projects. Communities of practice are groups of individuals who collaborate on shared interests to co-create and support evidence use to inform educational practice connected to the thematic knowledge network goals. Communities of practice will operate at local, regional, or cross-regional levels to address specific problems of practice. For example, the communities of practice may engage in inquiry, adaptation, and use of evidence-informed practices to benefit students' engagement, learning, achievement, and well-being. <coughs> they may also bring together educators, researchers, intermediaries, and others on a shared priority to inform co-construction, co-learning, and use of evidence to inform educational practices connected to the larger network's priority goal. They may also demonstrate a range of KMB knowledge mobilization strategies, such as developing and sharing actionable tools and resources linked to the network theme, developing lesson plans and teaching materials, toolkits, checklists, implementation and practice guidelines, and other resources that make it easy for practitioners to integrate evidence-informed practices into their daily routines. They may also partner and collaborate with the ministry, the NAIR Planning and Implementation Committee, and the NAIR Secretariat to mobilize knowledge. They'll provide a space for ongoing significant and appropriate interaction and knowledge exchange, co-learning, partnering, and collaboration. And they will also self-assess, monitor, and report on progress, outcomes, and impact, and use self-assessment and monitoring for future planning. Each thematic knowledge network will establish a small number of communities of practice to address priority questions. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Davood. Awesome. Thank you so much, Linda. So uh, over the next few minutes, um, I'll go through some of the general and evolving roles of social media use. And now that you have a pretty good uh, background on the structure and implementation of our NAIR model, I'll also discuss some of the ways that we're using social media to disseminate research and information, communicate with the sector, 
and even help foster networking and the development of networks. Uh, while through the next few slides I'll present some of the ways that we have leveraged social media to benefit our activities, I'm, I will also raise some of the limitations of social media and why it really needs to be seen as a means to an end rather than an end in of itself. So social media really uh, loosely refers to the intricate web of digital platforms that have been designed to keep us connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and really 365 days a year. And we all are, um, pretty, I'm pretty sure, aware of the different platforms that range from the likes of Facebook, where we share the stories that really resonate with us, to Twitter, where I'm sure others will agree with me, uh, we spend most of our time finding ways to meet the 140 character word count and come up with catchy hashtags so our tweets could be recognized. Um, Although it's really um, truly inspiring to hear um, how people around the world have used the power of social media to start revolutions and topple dictators, um, but for the most part, um, we continue to social media continues to be a place where we where we share cute cat cat pictures and stalk some people, <laughs> or as T. S. Eliot timelessly puts it. Distract, keep us distracted. Thomasly puts it, distraction from distractions. Um, regardless of how we use social media, and as this uh, um, picture really uh, demonstrates, uh, one thing that does not really need any debate is the exponential growth of social media uh, used throughout the world. Um, almost 60% of North Americans are on social media and uh, roughly 31% of the world's population. And if you calculate that, that's um, around 2 billion people and I'm sure it's growing. Um, with this increase, there has been a growing interest in use of social media amongst researchers, policymakers, and practitioners in the education sector to leverage, uh, to leverage it to create meaningful and lasting connections and share best practices and mobilize knowledge. The potential social media has to establish these meaningful connections are really explored in depth by Whitaker, Zoll, and Cassas in their book, What Connected Educators Do Differently. Um, uh, throughout this book, uh, the authors give several concrete examples of how social media, uh, and, and in their case in particular Twitter, has been used amongst educators to create connections and share ideas and best practices. They also provide um, throughout the book several practical steps of how, how you can, um, from a very basic um, uh, baby stages, transition and beneficially use Twitter to create those connections and share those, um, make, uh, share those resources. An example uh, that they give are virtual communities of practice. Now, uh, Linda had uh, uh, defined communities of practice, which are really groups of people who share a concern, a set of problems, or a passion about a topic, and who deepen their knowledge and expertise in the area by interacting on an ongoing basis. So really, if you look at it, uh, it's very similar to learning, um, where engaging in or being part of these communities of practice is very much a social process. And for this reason, um, uh, social networking technologies are an excellent medium to use for the establishment of communities of practice or virtual communities of practice. Um, another example that they give are Twitter chats. Uh, now, Twitter chat is a prearranged chat that happens on Twitter uh, through the use of tweets uh, and that usually include a predefined or a number of predefined hashtags to link all those tweets together. Um, and you're really creating, through this way, you're really creating a virtual conversation with people from uh, different parts of the world. Um, it's a really great way to network, educate, and establish credibility, uh, as it provides a, a convenient opportunity for you to meet others in your profession and connect with renowned experts in a particular topic, I mean, depending on what the, uh, the hashtag and the topic of conversation is. Given the potential uh, of social media, uh, the NAIR uh, in has incorporated a strong social media strategy from its onset. Now, NAIR social media strategies include both the linear and relationship approaches. The linear approach involves uh, the static method or a tweet of tweeting or pushing out uh, different projects, different products, or promoting events. 
Uh, however, at the same time, the NAIR Twitter strategy is also attempting to build connections, facilitate relationships, and promote the use of knowledge mobilization strategies in the education sector. Um, a central component of the NAIR social media um, strategy and activities is the NAIR Twitter account. Uh, through consistency, the NAIR Twitter account has grown from its very humble beginnings when it had about 250 followers. And today, if you follow, uh, if you take a look at hashtag at NAIR um, slash recre, uh, we have over uh, 2,500 followers and 13,000 tweets. As a part of a commitment uh, to knowledge mobilizations and engaging with a wider audience, uh, the NAIR directors, which you were um, introduced to earlier, um, co-hosted um, a, a number of Twitter chats with, with a hashtag of KMB chat to kind of uh, connect all the tweets, where particip participants engaged online in questions concerning knowledge mobilization practices and also provided future suggestions for uh, the future directions for NAIR. Um, another uh, aspect of uh, the NAIR social media strategy is the website. Um, it, it provides a central place for all the updates and news related to NAIR, but also, as Sia uh, touched uh, upon earlier as well, it also features regular blogs and events updates. And these blogs are written by uh, experts throughout the field. And again, we highly encourage you to go and check it out. Um, as we move forward, the NAIR social media strategy will continue to play an integral role in the NAIR model and also stay true to the fact that a social media strategy cannot remain static, but rather continuously evolve and enhance in dynamic ways. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the aspects that the NAIR social media strategy will focus on in the future will be targeted community building and developing more meaningful connections in particular amongst the NAIR thematic networks and communities of practice that Linda was uh, speaking about. The goal will be that those involved in the networks and communities of practice will engage each other in intuitive ways to actively share knowledge and products that are designed to enhance their work. Of course, using social media as part of a uh, knowledge mobilization strategy is not entirely a walk in the park. Despite the many benefits and importance of incorporating uh, social media uh, as part of the strategy, it does carry several challenges. One of the first challenges are expectations. Um, adopting social media doesn't necessarily mean you'll suddenly have this uh, uh, amazing ability to disseminate to millions of people around the world. Uh, because let's admit it, tweeting about proven teaching models is not exactly the same as tweeting a picture of a cute, adorable kitten doing what cute, adorable kitten do. Therefore, the tweets may not generate the same level of likes and retweets and shares. So it really is a long process that re requires consistency, and that's one of the main uh, points, consistency. Furthermore, uh, I'm going to move over a slide before I come back. This is a snapshot of what happens every minute on various social media platforms. Um, I mean, you can see the, the, just the, the, the amount of activity that goes on every 60 seconds. Um, so one of the challenges is really remaining relevant in a sea of tweets and posts and reaching intended audience and targets. So uh, the, one of the other threats is uh, over-exhaustion, or, uh, or another term for it is being tweeted out. Uh, this is also a point that is covered in the book, um, um, What Connected Educators Do Differently, that I spoke about earlier. Um, depending on the community you target, there will come a point where the number of followers really reaches a, a plateau. Uh, and after that, it becomes really difficult to increase your following, uh, which leads to the final challenge of measuring impact. Um, the most common metrics that we see used in the sector are hits, visits, page, uh, page uh, visits or to the page, likes, number of followers, etc. Um, however, gauging whether these connections and statistics <coughs> have actually translated into meaningful results can be very tricky. Um, to expand a little further on this, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Sophia Malik, um, who will discuss in more depth the aspects of measuring impact. 
Thank you very much, Davood. I really appreciate it. Now, I, I do see some interesting uh, questions being raised in the chat and some points being made about the future of Twitter, which I do actually want to, to speak a little bit about the, this role of using a platform such as Twitter for social media and reaching audiences. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come there in a moment, but I, I want to actually just kind of close the loop here on, on some of the lessons learned from Nair. And there are many. So um, throughout the course of its lifetime thus far, we've seen a lot of successes um, in the Nair project in terms of what it has been able to do, reaching uh, diverse um, groups across the province, but in enhancing collaboration and building relationships in the sector. Um, there were about 150 different partners identified of various types involved in the 44 project. And um, there was definitely network creation and expansion, which included growing awareness of the types of, of prep, the type of plans and preparations needed for knowledge mobilization to grow and expand networks. Um, there was also an increased awareness about the concept of knowledge mobilization in itself, and an increased capacity through targeted funding for project support, as well as changing mindsets around professional learning. There was also a significant uh, and noteworthy creation and dissemination of knowledge products with more than 1,000 outputs, um, such as some that we've mentioned that are on the NAIR website, toolkits, and events, and so on. Now, um, I do want to mention that there were, of course, lessons. So it's not without uh, learning, because this is a, a newer initiative. Uh, and as we enter into phase two, we're applying some of our learnings from the first phase to, to, to understand that you know, really utilizing and mobilizing uh, existing research can support improvements in professional learning. And, 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 and we are um, looking at how this, this impacts and affects teachers and students and how we can reach our audiences and target audiences, including parents. Um, there is a lot of, you know, from learning communities we learn, we know Linda referred to the communities of practice. Um, that we need to be able to support and provide more and greater opportunities for collaboration, the sharing of knowledge and professional learning through various me uh, means, for instance, workshops, um, events, um, bringing people together and creating more opportunities for these different groups and stakeholders to come together. Um, the, the benefits of this are from being able to develop uh, usable and useful outputs and the cultivation of longer-term partnerships and networks. And I had mentioned sustainability being a challenge. That's definitely an area that we are in, in, uh, trying to learn more about, about how to build in those supports and those systems. So um, circling back to the notion of impact, and, and Davood talked about the, the measuring of impact. So there are a couple of things I want to mention. Um, from, from our work, we have learned that understanding how to measure impact um, is an area that really requires a lot greater capacity. We're not actually seeing it happen to, um, to a large extent among our partners. We as a ministry are now actually engaging in different forms of process evaluation to learn about, learn as we go basically, and have a feedback loop which helps us to understand whether what we're doing is working and it, whether the strategies are reaching our intended audiences. And as such, we've, t we've been uh, uh, taking it on to, to have a developmental evaluation to inform the next phase of NAIR, where we want to work closely with uh, the, evaluate the external evaluators to help uh, throughout working with the NAIR secretariat, with our ministry team, and with our network hosts throughout the next four years of implementation. So I mean, really, at the core of it, it's about, you know, you, it's great to have all these activities and strategies and so on, including social media. But at the same time, how do you know what you're doing is working? How do you know that you're reaching or not reaching the intended audiences? And also, at a higher level of thinking, how do you know that that the, the work is actually being understood, shared, and used. So there are three different types of research use. Um, one of them being um, one of them being instrumental use. So that's for specific pieces of research use and the direct impact. The direct impact is seen on uh, research and policy and practice decisions. 
Um, conceptual uses of research, on the other hand, are more the complex and indirect ways that research can change our ways of thinking and alert, I mean, can alert policymakers to an issue. It's more about general consciousness raising. Um, thirdly, the symbolic uses of research, that, that, that's often referred to as either the symbolic or the political uses of research, where there, there may be either a bias inherent in the approach, or it may be that research is being used to validate pre-existing notions or suppositions. Um, and it also may be, uh, it may also include, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, the use of research serving a political agenda. And conversely, there's also uh, non-use of research, which there, a lot of this is politically laden and complex, and, and it depends largely a lot on the, the culture of an organization and the players involved. Um, so, so we did we did touch upon some of the limitations of um, social media. So, with a lot of power, a lot of potential, um, David had walked you through um, a lot of uh, the, the 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 approaches, the advantages, and also um, touching upon some of the challenges with social media. So, you know, one one key key area is about how do you again, as I mentioned, about impact. It's that there are different ways of trying to understand your reach and audience, and I'd be interested in hearing from our, our group that's joining us today um, what ways that you're engaging in measuring impact, um, whether it has to do with the knowledge mobilization um, efforts that you're engaging in, or whether it has to do with, uh, with, with your use of social media. But um, what we've seen is we do actually look at you know, the number of followers as they're increasing and so on as, as a means of understanding our, our reach. Um, we do also track the analytics on a weekly basis for the Twitter website, um, but we, we do simultaneously recognize that that doesn't necessarily tell us the whole story. That does not also tell us whether we're making an impact and what, what the impact is. Um, so that said, you know, there's almost like a gradient of levels of, um, of of impact or of reaching people. So you know, at a, a more you know peripheral, sorry, more uh, beginning level, there's generating awareness, right? So all of these have play an important role, but um, uh, it's about the level of breadth and depth of being able to engage with the the um, evidence and to engage with audiences' use of it. So generating awareness, sharing resources, these are great things that you can achieve through the use of different social media, such as Twitter. Um, and one thing I want to point out is that I think there is still yet a challenge in reaching diverse audiences. We need to acknowledge that while the world is moving greatly towards the use of social media, um, that not everyone is necessarily on Twitter, let's say. Um, we're not necessarily reaching you know, uh, some of our more vulnerable communities or marginalized or underrepresented communities uh, as well. And this is a, a key um, issue for us, particularly in, in education. We want to make sure that we're able to have the same message out for all um, and the same access. Um, so it's about engaging with users, and this is an area we're continuing to develop and understand. So I do actually want to take a look at some of the, the comments and questions that we receive now and address them. I, I noticed there's a bit of a discussion around the Twitter piece. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned, there are some of the limitations involved. And, um, and I, I do see um, some discussion around uh, a question from earlier from Radha and Joanne saying, you know, a question about the future of Twitter, right? And then a response, I believe, from, was it Paul? Um, looking at, you know, what the future is. Now, that, that inevitably, you know, these are, these are um, platforms that may come and go over periods of time. Some have uh, longer staying power, like Facebook definitely has had quite uh, a strong stint, but that's not necessarily, we don't know what the future will hold, that that's going to be the same, or how we adapt and change according to what new technologies and platforms emerge. I think, too, there's a question about, do we know whether older adults are using Twitter? And I was, um, I was reading something very recently, just in the last day or so, that was talking about the, the use of social media generally by 
uh, the various demographic groups, and certainly um, the age group that, you know, the greater than 65, which I think were, which is sort of borderline between baby boomers and traditionalists, um, the, the use of social media is much less. Than, um, than among younger folks. So yes, your, your point about that we'd be missing those, those people with Twitter is, is well taken. Absolutely. I think about my 78-year-old father who wants nothing to do with <laughs> Facebook. I think um, he, he went on for one day and then he said, this is not for me. <laughs> Similarly, he, I mean, he, he barely even wants to carry around a cell phone. <laughs> Um, so I do see a point being made about, you know, lots of platforms, Jessica has mentioned lots of platforms have come and gone. Yes, that's true. MySpace, GeoCities being some examples. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's hard to imagine when, when something is in its height of popularity, but inevitably, you know, things do have a, a timeline, a lifespan. And, and, I'll, and I'll add also that I guess um, at the same time, uh, the advantage of using these social media platforms is that uh, in real sense it doesn't really cost anything to uh, use, use them and uh, to, to um, you know, share these uh, products and uh, other than time. So I mean even with the, with the issue of change, uh, different platforms coming and going, um, that's why there's a balance between how much you use social media and, and making sure that the time that is being spent on it, especially for the specific uh, aspects of knowledge mobilization, or, or um, is actually gaining the results. I think. Thank you. Um, I did have a question actually. On I was looking on the project resource toolkit on the NAIR website, um, and you guys have a great list of different knowledge mobilization strategies and different resources there. Um, do you have a sense of? either through the analytics of that website or just in general, which of those strategies may have been more um, accessed or which have been more in influential uh, or which may have even been more effective in mobilizing the knowledge? Yes, thank you for your question. So really, um, we do have a sense of which, which products or w w like what's being accessed more. Um, we, we, we could definitely do some more work around taking it a step further in terms of effectiveness and actual use by our target audiences. But we do know that the most used one is the toolkit that's the most downloaded and accessed and shared. So that's the, the um, knowledge mobilization, the NAIR toolkit of resources. Um, we, we do know the website uh, has definitely, I don't have the numbers handy, but the um, number of visits to the website have been increasing steadily. Um, of course, when there are certain announcements, like for instance, we recently announced a call for proposals for the thematic network, that there's a higher uh, traffic, higher volume of traffic um, towards, directed towards the NAIR website and to particular pages at those times. Um, the team itself, the university partners, are, are actively involved with tweeting daily, often at least twice a day, um, and around trying to generate interest and activity towards the website and the different, um, the different activities they're engaged in. Um, however, again, you know, to, back to the point about how this is an area we definitely need to develop. Great. Thank you. Um, I also noticed Rada had another question going back to day one. Um, of our conference where we are addressing some of the issues around people with visual disabilities um, or visual impairments. Uh, Thank have, you. You guys, have you considered on how uh, using Twitter or Twitter chats especially you'll be able to help people with a visual disability access that information or even on your website? Or Thank you for the question. Yes, so there are a couple of things and I'm going to also um, have my colleagues jump in, um, but I want to mention that the AODA compliance, so that's what something uh, government is moving towards, um, what it stands for, Linda? <laughs> it, it's um, Access for Ontarians with Disabilities Act is what AODA stands for. And um, <laughs> that is something that government websites in, in Ontario, um, public-facing websites now are compliant um, so that they can be accessed by um, folks with visual impairment and, and others. And now the, the Knowledge Network for Applied Education Research website is not a government site per se, and I don't, I believe it's not fully compliant as of yet, but there will be a, a timeline for 
for it becoming compliant as well. And that would include then sub subsequently the different activities undertaken, such as a Twitter chat. Um, and one example um, is, you know, just at a basic level, uh, is that you know using um, Arial 12 font in all of our interfaces and our email communications and our documents, and ensuring that whatever documents that we've posted, um, that those also reflect quite stringent guidelines for AODA compliancy. And so while we're at the beginnings of, of, of our efforts here, we are definitely in the process of trying to ensure that everything we do uh, reflects the compliance. 